All right, thank you, John chapter 14 in the Word of God tonight, Gospel of John chapter 14. Good to see you on this night, and hard to believe we're already at this point in the meeting. But uh, tonight, I want us to really build on what we've seen the last couple of nights and uh, apply it. And so let's look at a passage that does this. As I mentioned the other night when I was dealing with the book, The Wind of the Spirit, John 14, 15, and 16 is these final hours that Jesus had with those closest to him, his apostles, uh, just before the cross, so just before uh, the Garden of Gethsemane and all the events that lead up right to the crucifixion. And he's talking about the fact that he's going to leave, but that he's sending the Holy Spirit. And here's what life will be like when the Spirit comes. And so let's look at John 14. This is early in the discourse. And uh, let's go to verse 23, where we have a most amazing statement. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man, a human being, love me, he will keep my words. I remember seeing this 20 years ago and thinking, could that mean what it sounds like? <laughs> That's a stunning phrase. If a man love me, he will keep my words. The title of the message is, It's a Promise. Now let's pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit to open our understanding really to the simplicity and yet the uh, weight of this truth. Lord, I pray that you breathe on us tonight. Now, Spirit of the living God, we do need you to be our teacher. Open the eyes of our understanding. Lord, to the amazing truth connected to these words. And Lord, I pray that you'll move us from wishful thinking, where that's the case, to a convinced confidence. And so stir us that the faith response would be the obvious natural response. Lord, I pray you use truth tonight to make a difference in the actual day-in, day-out living of, of just regular our, our, our lives on a day-in, day-out basis. And so, Lord, I plead the blood. Protect us from Satan's attack tonight. Lord Jesus, I claim our position in you on the throne, far above the enemy. And in your name, I exercise your authority over any powers of darkness that would seek to hinder tonight and trust you that that not be allowed. Lord, breathe on us afresh tonight. Thrill us with your truth. And may we truly love Jesus. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. When someone that you know has that sparkle in their eyes, and they look at you and say, it's a promise. <laughs> then you know, especially if it's a parent to a kid and Christmas time is near or something like that, uh, they're, they're counting on that promise. But friends, when the person giving the promise is Jesus, it's even of a greater weight. Because in our human world, there are times when we make promises that we intend to fulfill, and sometimes uh, something happens and we're not able to. But with Jesus, this is that which will be fulfilled. And it truly is a promise. You see, Jesus says here, if a man loved me, he will keep my words. In other words, when you love Jesus, you live Jesus. You see, when you choose Jesus, you experience Jesus. What do we mean when we say that? Well, tonight, let's ask a few questions to just guide us through this initial thought and look to this passage and the Holy Spirit to answer those questions for us. The first question is, what does the word keep mean? In verse 23, it says, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And I ask that question because this word is used in a variety of passages in a variety of ways. <laughs> And that shouldn't surprise us. Obviously, uh, in our language, this is true in any language, we have some words that uh, have multiple possible meanings. And it's the context that determines which nuance or which definition applies. For example, over in Acts 16, in the account of uh, uh, Paul and Silas and the Philippian jailer, uh, we're told there that uh, the uh, keeper there's our word, of the prison, the guard, the keeper uh, of the prison was to uh, guard them, that is, keep them. Well, that meant, obviously, <laughs> from escaping. So there's an interesting uh, wording there. We have this word used in the crucifixion account in Matthew when it says that the Roman soldiers watched Jesus there. That would be similar to the 
Acts 16 passage. They watched in the sense of guarding what was going on. So there's that guard sense again, uh, but a little bit different uh, because uh, of the idea of watching in order to guard. So a slightly different nuance there. But then in James 2 and verse 10, it says, if a man keep the whole law, keep the whole law, there's our word, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Well, in that verse, if a man keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. What does it mean in that verse? If a man obey the whole law and yet disobey in one point, he is guilty of all. So which one is it? Guard, watch, or obey? Well, I used to choose watch because that was the easiest one to do. <laughs> if a man <laughs> love me, he will watch my <laughs> words. Okay, uh, that sounded easy, so that was a good interpretation. <laughs> but that's not the best way to go about interpretation. We have a clue because right here in this context, if you read on, Jesus is speaking there. You can see those red letters. And before you even get to the end of the chapter, he says in verse 31, right at the end, but that the world may know that I love the Father. So there's that thought again. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Ah, well, that's the sense of obedience. Well, that's the context. So if a man love me, he will obey my words. All right. Let's go to a second question. Is this really a promise? And I ask that because if you are familiar with the passage, you may be familiar with the words up in verse 15, where they're very similar, but there is a big difference. There it says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Okay, so in verse 23, it's worded as a promise. In verse 15, it's worded as a command. And there's a big difference there because if it's a command, that's just what we can't seem to do. In fact, I had a man in a meeting in Asheville, North Carolina. He says, he said, that verse slays me all the time. And you can tell he was very agitated <laughs> uh, that, uh, uh, with, that, with that thought. Well, what is it? Now, here's uh, what's interesting about this whole passage. There is a bit of debate among theologians as to whether or not it is a command or whether or not it is a future tense. And I'm not going to go into the reasons for that debate, but let's settle the debate. Let's go back to verse 15, and uh, let's analyze it and see uh, uh, if it could be translated in the future tense um, or, uh, uh, or not. If you love me, there's the command, keep my commandments. Could it be translated the other way? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay, yeah, it could go either way. And I'm sure if you're... Uh, uh, Big on English, you're thinking, oh, you know, that's a second person plural. Isn't that what you were thinking? <laughs> okay, uh, none of us are thinking that when we look at that. But it is a second person plural. With the second person plural, it could go either way. Uh, it could be translated as the command or it could be translated as the future tense. That doesn't help us. But let's go to verse 23 and see uh, how, this, uh, how this works. There, it switches from that second person plural, if you love me, to the third person singular, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Let's see if the imperative could work there. If a man love me, keep my words. That can't work because that would be switching midstream from third person singular to second person plural. Now, isn't it amazing all that stuff in grammar that we just ignored in grammar school? When you read the Bible, it, it, it's important. <laughs> It's fascinating to me, uh, but the truth of the matter is, in verse 23, it could only be the future because there's the third person singular. You can't switch in the middle of the stream, if a man love me, and then switch to second person plural, keep my commandments. So there, there's no debate. Now, here's one of the important uh, principles of interpretation. When you have a passage that's clear on a given matter, and a, a passage that is not as clear, it could be debated, it could go this way, it could go this way, you have to interpret the unclear in the light of the clear because the clear is not debatable. So that helps us immensely. Verse 23 is absolutely clear. There's no debate there. There's no question there. There's not any debate at all among any theologians uh, that respect the authority of the word of God. If a man love me, he will keep my words. That is stated as a promise. 
Now, we can also just think about the analogy of faith. In other words, other passages that can lend light, truth from other scripture that can help us. If this is a command, then we are trying to prove, as it were, uh, our love. If a man love me, keep my commandments. And so there the idea is trying to obey, to approve your love and God, thus gain acceptance. And that throws us right back into that bondage of a performance-based acceptance, which we confronted briefly last night. In other words, let's look at it this way. If this is a promise, it's a matter of trusting the one who gave the promise. If it is a command, it is a matter of pleasing the one who gave the command. You say, well, both of those sound good. You're right, so let's go further. If this is a promise, it's a matter of trusting in Jesus because he's the one who gave it. So it's you and I trusting Jesus. If it's a command, it's a matter of trusting yourself. you got to obey it. Hmm, that's interesting. It's you trying, whereas if it's a promise, it's you trusting if it is a promise, the power is in Jesus to fulfill his promise. If it is a command, the power is resting on you to obey it. Well, that's just what we can't do. If this is a promise, the focus is on Jesus, the object of faith, the one who gave the promise. If it is a command, the focus is on a system, all the stuff we need to do, all the commandments in order to please. And now we begin to get weighed down again. If this is a promise, it is relational with a person. If it's command, it is more ritual with all the things we need to do uh, to obey these commandments. If it is a promise, the reliance is on a divine person, Jesus, who gave it. If it is a command, the reliance is on our human performance. Oh, we don't always do well with that. If this is a promise, there's freedom because Jesus who gave the promise is the one who enables you to fulfill it. If it is a command, instead of freedom, it's bondage because you're on your own. In other words, there's a subtle deception that most Christians face early in their journey as a new believer. You get saved, and then you're going down that road, and you come to a fork in the road. And one sign says, trusting God. The other sign says, pleasing God. Which path do we typically take? Pleasing God. Because that's what we want to do. We want to please God. And that's a good thing. But here's what the scripture says in Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith, trusting God, it's impossible to please him. Wow. Now that's amazing. And we've got to get a hold of that or we miss out. I... Uh, have a friend who brought this to my attention because he had been on, a, he had some very, uh, uh, very difficult things happen in his life and, and his, uh, his family fell apart, his ministry fell apart. It was a, it was a big mess and uh, so on. But through all that, God opened his eyes to this truth and uh, it radically changed him. And uh, he, was, uh, he was wonderfully changed. And so the point here is the first and greatest commandment is to what? To love Jesus. And without that, you can't obey any of the other ones. You see, that love part is key, but in that love, there's more detail that flows out. We'll see that here in a moment. This friend of mine, I was in a meeting with him some years ago, and uh, we had gone to college together, and he started out as a youth pastor. I started uh, out as an assistant pastor, and then uh, he took a church as a senior pastor. I went into full-time evangelism, so he had started inviting me for meetings. And uh, uh, I would preach, and, and uh, he would never talk about the meeting or the, the preaching, not that he needed to, but that was interesting to me. He never talked about the content of the week, uh, but we just had a good time, and he'd invite me back because we were buds from college <laughs> and so on. And, uh, but I always wondered whether or not he understood what I was uh, seeking to convey in the meetings because he never talked about it. And then, uh, some years later, I'd been with him several times. I was in a meeting just like this. Uh, it happened to be a Thursday night, and as I was preaching, his wife stood up and, and walked out. And I thought she was going to the restroom. But she was walking out on him. And he found out afterwards, uh, he had two kids still at home, and they went berserk, understandably so. And uh, it was a nightmare. 
And uh, long story short, yes, he lost his marriage, and therefore uh, he, he had to step down from pastoring, and, and it was a mess. And for about 18 months, he spiraled down into despair, probably made some attempts on suicide. I don't know that for sure. That's implied with some of the things he uh, said to me. But uh, we, we talk often because I was there when that uh, all happened. And if I picked up the phone, I knew it was probably going to be two hours, hour and a half minimum because he was just so heartbroken and understandably so. And uh, he was spiraling down and he was so depressed that his two children that were still at home, they just didn't want to be around him. Because he was just always depressed. And then he watched a video of a message called The Room of Grace. And in that message, that preacher talked about this pathway and that fork. And one sign saying pleasing God, that's what he'd been trying to do for years. And the other sign saying trusting God. And he began to dive into that thought and uh, began to study this. And uh, he found a book by that same uh, uh, preacher, and he was reading that book. It's a book really on the spirit for life. And he would call me and say, you know, John, John, he said, this man is saying this. He said, isn't that what you've been preaching? So he was listening, <laughs> even though he never talked about it. And uh, he said, that's what you preach, right? I said, yes. He said, but yeah, but this man's in a different circle. <laughs> Different camp of churches, whatever word you want to use. I said, it doesn't matter. The truth is the truth. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, God began to open the eyes of this friend of mine, and he began to come up out of that spiral. He began to experience Jesus. He began to experience that mega grace we talked about two nights ago. He began to experience the supernatural enablement through the spirit of Jesus to actually do God's will. He began to experience the very life of Jesus and therefore that fruit of Jesus, which is love and joy. And the joy of the Lord began to flow and his kids began to notice the difference. In the next number of months leading to the next year or two, he was so radically changed. Those same kids that just really didn't want to be around him now delighted in being around him because... Jesus was flowing. He literally was a channel of the life stream of Jesus Christ. And uh, wow, what an amazing thing. And uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he, uh, I learned much from him. I mean, he just, he just pursued Jesus. He, he, oh, I mean, he, he, he is like a rocket just going right into, into experience uh, of truth. You know, some people take years and uh, some uh, do it quickly. Well, he did it quickly at that point. Then the Lord uh, allowed him to get leukemia and just said, come on home. So he's with the Lord. Now, it's a promise. See, he got a hold of this. That Wait a second. I've been so just trying to, he was all about, you know, you got you to do this and you got to do this. All the stuff we talked about last night. All of that stuff is good, but the way you get there is not by looking at the stuff. You got to look at Jesus. If a man loved me, you got to love Jesus. See, that's the point. So... We've asked, what does keep mean? It means obey. Is it really a promise or is it a command? It is a promise. So uh, third question, how does it work? All right, well, let's back up to that verse 15. And uh, with that understanding, let's begin to walk through. He says, if you love me, now with our understanding, you will keep my commandments. How does this work? And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. That word another means another of the same kind. And so Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I'm sending another of the same kind, that he may abide with you forever. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm leaving, but I am sending the comforter. And uh, uh, he will, he's another of the same kind, and he will abide with you. And so that word abide, when we abide in him, that's by faith. When he abides in us, that's grace. That's him enabling us. You see, the comforter, the helper, and he will help you. Now, friends, the truth of the matter is, you and I need supernatural help. We saw it the other night, that God gives mega grace. Why? Because we need it. And so we saw last night that those who keep taking this abundance of grace and the gift of the righteousness of Jesus, those are the ones who reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. And so let's read on, verse 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And so he says, look, I'm leaving, but I'm sending the spirit. And you know him because he already dwells with you, but now he's going to be in you. That is an amazing thought. He will be in you. In other words... No other religion has the founder moving right into the very hearts of the followers, except Bible Christianity. Jesus 
See, and the Christian life is not ritual. It's the life of Christ moving in. And friends, that means the Christian life for us and our experience is not a matter of imitation because flesh cannot imitate spirit. It's a matter of impartation where the spirit brings the very throne life of Jesus right into us to impart to us that very divine life of Jesus so that I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. Literally, as orphans, I will come to you. Now, wait a second. He just said, I'm leaving. He just said he's sending the Spirit. But then he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, this is wonderful. This means that the, uh, the Spirit is not here merely in the stead of Jesus. He's bringing the life of Jesus right into us. And Jesus in his glorified body sits on the throne, but by his Spirit, he lives in us. I will come to you. And that's why Galatians 2.20 can say, Christ lives in me. Absolutely amazing. Verse 19, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but you see me because I live you shall live also. Because I live, you shall live also. Why? Because it's his life. Christ lives in me. Because I live, you will live. Why? Because you will experience life himself. Him. That's what he's uh, talking about. In other words, you will live also to that full ex fullest extent possible, this side of heaven. Now, have you ever wondered about that verse over in Hebrews 4 that says the word of God is quick, that is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit? So the old writers, the old preachers and theologians used to say that when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, their spirit fell into their soul. <laughs> and that through the new birth... When the Spirit is regenerated, that's what we talked about at the end of the message last night, and God's divine nature is implanted, God's seed, 1 John 3, 9, God's nature implanted into you. Okay, when that happens, that's where the Holy Spirit moves in. And when we walk in the Spirit, then the Spirit, joined to our Spirit, lifts the Spirit part of our constitution up out of the soul to rule over the soul and body. So Andrew Murray and some of those guys talk about this kind of detail. <laughs> it's fascinating, body, soul, and spirit. Now think about it. In the unsaved condition, the spirit is hidden away. In the saved but carnal condition, the spirit is hidden away. And so it's only when you are saved and spirit-filled that the three parts actually look like three parts. In other words... In the unsaved condition, or in the saved but carnal condition, we look like two parts, just body and soul. But in the spirit-filled condition, that's when the word divides asunder between soul and spirit. How does it do that? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the... See, there's no access to the spirit-filled life, no access to this life in the spirit except by faith, because without faith, it's impossible to please him. And faith is based on words. And when you depend on the words, that's when the Spirit enables and joined to your spirit lifts the spirit part of you to rule over the soul and body. And that's how the word divides asunder between soul and spirit. And when the Holy Spirit joined to your spirit uh, uh, raises up, as it were, uh, to rule over the soul and body, that's when you experience Jesus to the fullest extent this side of heaven. That's when there's that freedom. That's when there's that fruit of the Spirit, which is love, which has eight slices, joy, all the way to temperance, and all of that's manifested freely. And so it's beautiful. You see, when you love Jesus, you live Jesus. Verse 20, at that day, ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. In other words, when he has finished the work of the cross, risen from the dead, gone to the throne, sent the Spirit, and bring, the Spirit brings that life of Christ right into us, at that day, when you grab a hold of this, and you love Jesus, and you yield to Jesus, and you by faith walk with Jesus, you shall know. That's the word that means know experientially. You shall experientially know that he is in the Father, and that we are in him, and he is in us. 
Now, friends, when we actually walk in the uh, Spirit and experience grace, you know. In other words, when you respond with patience and normally you would have been very impatient, you know experientially. <laughs> You're in the Father, or Christ is in the Father. You're in Christ, and he's in you. You are experiencing God. You're experiencing Jesus in those settings when normally you'd fly off the handle and just blow your stack and, and you respond with sweetness and might even giggle and laugh. <laughs> you know, and everybody else does too. <laughs> hey, they're experiencing Jesus. You see, that's what he's saying here. You'll know experientially that you're in Jesus and that Jesus is in you. Verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. We'll come back to those three phrases. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest, beautiful word, myself to him. One author puts it this way, Christ giving the evidence of, by the action of the Holy Spirit on the souls of the disciples that he is alive in heaven, and now they are experiencing that life in them. They're experiencing Jesus. In fact, uh, when I was here during the COVID time, I preached a message called Life Streaming. I'm sure everybody remembers it with all of the details. But friends, there it is. It's the Spirit bringing that throne life of Jesus, streaming it right into us. It's better than live streaming. That's just seeing something that's taking place somewhere else. This is live streaming, where you experience the very life stream of God, the life stream of Jesus through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Verse 23, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, see that word abode? That's the noun of the verb abide. Aren't you glad you came tonight? That was deep. <laughs> and uh, the abide word is such a beautiful word in 1 John 3 and John 6 and John 15. Uh, it is uh, portrayed as, you know, he says, without me, you can do nothing, which means with me, you can do everything you ought to do. And that's the outflow of those who abide in him and he abides in uh, them. So when we depend on him, that's abiding. That's when he enables us. That's how he abides in us. But now he uses this noun form. That those who love, the father will love that one. And he says, we, here's the triune God, will come unto him and make our abode with him, literally dwelling place, but it's translated in verse 2 as mansion. That's the same word. God is saying when you tap into the provision that he has given in Christ, and you don't just ignore him, you yield to, you love, you take, we'll see how that plays out here in a second, when all of that's real, then God makes your body his mansion, same word, his abode. And we will make our abode with him. That's amazing, our abiding place. Why? Because when you got saved, we saw it last night, the spirit part of your being was uh, raised with Christ, that new man. That's where the Holy Spirit moves in. That spirit part of you, that new man part of you, the new creation part of you, the seed of God part of you, that part of you is righteous and holy. That's the beachhead for the Holy Spirit to move in and now lead and empower from that point, from that core inside out, bringing the divine dynamic right into us and thus the abiding life. And all of that is through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So, what does the word keep mean? It means obey. But is this a promise or a command? It's a promise. Well, how does this work? It's all through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So one last question, and then we'll apply it. What's the sequence? Okay, I said we go back to verse 21. Let's do it. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now, all of the verbs there, hath, keep, and love, are in the present tense. So let's read it this way. He who is having my commandments and is keeping them, he it is who is loving me. So I want to ask you, what's the order? Not on the printed page, but based on the words, what's first? He says, he who is having, he who is taking, he who is trusting my commandments, 
and is keeping them, he it is who's loving me. So which one's first? Loving. See, when you love Christ, you choose Christ. When you choose Christ, you choose his words. <laughs> when you choose his words, you're trusting his words. When you're trusting his words, he graces you. He enables you. When he enables you, you obey his words. Now, that was detailed. Let's say it's simple. <laughs> when you love Christ, you take Christ. When you take Christ, he empowers you to obey. See, love, trust, and obey. There's your sequence. And that's why the first commandment is the greatest commandment, because you can't obey the rest of them without the first one. But when you love Christ, you're choosing him. You're having his commandments. You're taking, you're trusting. And when you trust, he empowers we have access by faith into this grace where we stand. We've seen that in the last two nights. And so when we trust Jesus based on his word, the spirit en enables us based on those same words. And so when you love, you therefore trust, therefore he enables so that you obey. You love, you take God at his word, and you obey. So let's apply it. There are triggers of temptation. We've noted last night or the night before that temptation was last night. Temptation itself is not sin, but uh, that trigger is there. Now we're faced with a choice. Are we going to love Jesus or love ourselves? That's about what it is. And so let's say here's a billboard. Let's say here's a temptation maybe to think impurely, and the reality is we can choose Jesus. We can take Jesus. We can tr trust Jesus. See, looking unto Jesus... In salvation, we get that. You look to Jesus in faith to save you. Okay, it's the same thing. It's looking in Jesus to, in faith to save you in the present tense. In this moment, it's choosing Jesus. So you're looking to him. You're choosing him. You're therefore trusting him. You're taking him. And that's when he enables you to obey. In other words, we don't think of all that sequence, but that's what happens. Here's this trigger. I'm taking Jesus. That means you loved him and you chose him and you're trusting him and he's going to enable you. And what happens is you're free now to obey. You're free to look the other way and be free from what you saw as if you did not see it. Now, the unsaved moralist or the saved moralist, either way, can say, oh, that's bad. Neck go this way while heart stays that way. That's not victory. No. Victory is taking Jesus, loving Jesus, looking to Jesus, trusting him. In other words, it's back to the illustration I gave you last night. If somebody handed you a $100 bill, said, I want to give this to you. If you're smart, what would you do? Take it. And if you're courteous, what would you say? Thank you. Okay, so there we go. Thank you, Jesus. In other words, it's not a set mantra of words. It's a transaction of faith which is starting with love. We may not think of it that way, but when you choose Jesus, that's love. You're choosing him. You're taking him. That's faith. That's when he enables you. That's grace. So you love, trust, and obey. That's how it works. But it may just be as simple as, thank you, Jesus, and you're free to look the other way and be free from what you saw as if you didn't see it. Now, friends, that means it's possible to go through the marketplace and the business place in our present world and come out unscathed. I remember a dear friend of, my, friend of mine, we were in Singapore, and uh, Singapore is basically a bunch of, uh, you know, it's, it's a city, it's a nation, but it's a city, and it's, it's, you know, all they have is an island, so they go up. <laughs> so all the buildings are, are tall, and uh, it's business and it's shopping. There's nothing else, there's no other space. So it's, uh, it's fascinating. And uh, so they were showing me around Singapore, and of course Singapore's on the equator, it's not... Uh, it's not cold. It's not northern Minnesota. <laughs> it's hot all the time, not just in the summer, but all the time, 365 days a year. And not everybody is modest. And it's so interesting. We were walking through that, uh, uh, the downtown area, you know, all these different, it's like a mall on every floor. I mean, it, it is a lady's dream. <laughs> it's a husband's nightmare. But nonetheless, uh, you know, you're, you're, there's all of the shopping, all this stuff. So we spent the day, and they showed me all the stuff. And my friend just made the comment. He said, you know, it's so wonderful today, just as we went through downtown Singapore to just take Jesus and be free. Oh. Bad.
That's the spirit for life. It is loving Jesus and therefore living Jesus. It is that love, trust, therefore you're empowered to obey sequence. And this that simple, you look unto Jesus and he offers and finishes faith. And there we go. That's how this works. And so there is, in that sense, a simplicity to it. I remember I was uh, in a meeting in Nova Scotia and I was emphasizing, look, when that temptation hits you, maybe it's to impatience, maybe it's to get angry, maybe it's to, you know, whatever. You, you look to Jesus there's that look of faith, that look of love as you choose him, and you take. And as we emphasize, we say, I said to them what I've been saying to you, say thank you, because the thank you means you believe you've received. I know that sounds trite, but it's not. And that's when you're empowered. Well, there was a, a young mother who said to the pastor's wife, I got to talk to Brother John, because I, I, I got to ask him some questions. So, uh, the next night, they had fellowship time after the service, just like you've had here. And so we're eating a couple of cookies, and I'm talking to her. And she says, all right. She says, I have several kids. Now, she said, last night, you said, temptation hits you. You take Jesus, you say thank you, and then he empowers you to obey. I said, right. She said, okay. She points to a toddler. She goes, that one's mine. <laughs> and she says, that one cries. And you could tell it was irritating her on a regular basis. She said, uh, so, she said this morning, she said, last night you said, you know, you take Jesus, thank you, and he, he empowers you. She said, so this morning, we got up, and sure enough, that one was crying. <laughs> That's how she said it. And she said, I remembered what you said, so she said, I said, Jesus, I'm taking you. <laughs> That's how she said it. And she said, thank you. And then her face softened. She said, you know, I was at peace. I said, that's it. She goes, that's it? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, normally you're not at peace. You're irritated, but you took Jesus and you were at peace. You experienced Jesus. She said, I did? <laughs> I said, yeah, that's the spirit for life. She said, you mean it's not just for preachers? <laughs> Friends, that's the deal. I mean, we try in our English language to try to describe faith. It's all in the intangible realm. But it's, it's just as real as taking a $100 bill, thank you, and uh, 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 acting on it. It's, it's just that we're talking about that which is spiritual instead of physical. And it gets much more rich when you start with that understanding of love, that you are loving Jesus. Therefore, you're taking Jesus, and therefore, he is the one who is enabling you. I have a friend who was brought up in a Christian home, got saved early, Christian school, all that. But somewhere along the line, as a teenager or a college kid, I can't remember, uh, he made some wrong choices uh, with some uh, uh, bad situations and got addicted. And then, uh, oh, wow, the struggle of addiction. I mean, people that are not addicted don't have any idea of the struggle uh, that people who are addicted have. And so it was a rough couple of years, and he finally got into a program where he was really getting helped, and he, uh, he, uh, he did well for 10 years. You know, that's a long time. And he took a drink. Oh, and that led to the drugs, and boom, down he went after 10 years. And oh, so now he's in and out of uh, programs and stuff again. And, but we stayed in touch because I'd gotten to know him. And uh, uh, if I uh, never heard from him, that meant things were going bad. When I hear from him, that means things are going good. <laughs> and uh, so I remember he wrote me, and he told me that things were going well. He says, but right now, I'm under spiritual attack. I have no idea what that meant at that moment, but obviously there was some kind of trigger and the temptation was strong. So I wrote him back. He had texted me. I texted him back. I said, you know, those attacks bring fear and dread because you're thinking, oh, man, am I going to blow it? Because you're right in the face of it. And uh, fear means we lose peace and joy. And without joy, we lose strength. So let me just stop right here in the middle of the text. <laughs> this is why Satan does things to make us fear. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. See, because when we get fearful, when we're all full of fear and dread, that means we lose peace and joy. And when we lose joy, 
since the joy is the Lord of our strength, we lose our strength and down we go. That's what Satan's after. When he does things to incite fear, he's after causing Christians to lose their strength. It's happening all across the country. This is his tactic. So I wrote back and said, look, this is how Satan does it. The attacks bring a, a fear and dread. Fear means you lose peace and joy. And without joy, you lose strength. But God has not given us the spirit of fear. I quoted that in the text. And then I went on to say, therefore, we can reject that fear. See, because he said, I'm under spiritual attack. So you could tell there was a fear right there. I said, we can reject that fear and say, Lord Jesus, you died so that I might have abundant life. And I am excited to see you overcome. And I hit send. 11 minutes went by, and ding, a text came in. His response was, amen. <laughs> exactly what I needed to hear, joy and peace restored already. Glory to God. You know what? That's real. Because guys like that just, the, the, the fake it till you make it thing doesn't work for them. <laughs> it's got to be real. Friends, this is real. I remember a couple of years ago, I was coming home to my home church in Ann Arbor, and a dear friend of mine said, you know, I was listening the other day to one of your sermons called The Way of Escape. I think I preached it here about 10 years ago. Uh, probably long enough ago I could preach it again and nobody know. But <laughs> at any rate, uh, uh, he, uh, he said, you know, you were talking about when you're hit, you're hit with temptation, you got to take Jesus. See, that's that loving Jesus. And, and when you do, he empowers you. So you take and act. You trust and obey. He said, and as the Lord would have it, Right as I'm listening, now this is Detroit traffic. He said, right as I'm listening, somebody did something, pulled in front of me, and he said, normally, he said, I got a really bad tendency toward uh, road rage. And so here I am listening to the way of escape. Somebody does something, and I'm about ready to respond like I used to. And I thought, wait a second. I'm listening to the way of escape. So he said, I put it on pause. <laughs> and he said, Jesus, I am taking you. Thank you. And he smiled real big. He said, you know what? All the rage went, it was gone. See, that's what we're talking about. That's how this works. And so there is a simple side to it. I remember a dear lady, one of my meetings some years ago, said, you know, I've been living under command, but I'm going to start living under promise. And that's beautiful. It is a promise. When you love Jesus, you live Jesus. When you choose Jesus, thus trusting him, that's when he enables you, and that's how you obey. Because when you love him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Vance Havner used to say it this way, that revival was falling in love with Jesus all over again. See, if we're just looking for a new formula will eventually be down in the dumps again. The answer is a person. It's not a mantra of words. It's not a formula of, of, of rituals. It is a personal relationship with Jesus. Where in the face of temptation, we love him. Thus, we choose him. Now, it's not based on your feelings. When that dear mother said, Jesus, I'm taking you, thank you, <laughs> the feelings weren't there. But love is a choice. And faith is a choice. And friends, when you love and therefore take Jesus, that's when you experience him. And that's when he frees you with his liberating, overcoming life. And so where needed, let's fall in love with Jesus all over again. Let's bow.